all of you who are logged in remotely should be able to see a small video screen of our residents. This is the Department of OBGYN Residency Program, and it looks like almost everyone is here. And we have myself as Eurogyne faculty and Miriam Seitz, who just joined us as well. Uh, so the host is the University of Hawaii, Johnny Burns School of Medicine, Department of OBGYN and Women's Health. Our presenter is on the bottom left of your screen. That's Jennifer Wong. She is one of six third year residents and she is applying for a Eurogyne fellowship. So I stuck her in that seat to highlight her abilities and put some pressure on her to perform well because some of you are program directors. I'm the moderator, Stephen Manalia. Uh, we have Chris Maher dialing in from Australia. I believe it's very early there, 6 a.m. Uh, the next day. And contributors will be Thomas Gregory, Carl Jalad, and myself. Uh, these are alternative phone numbers that you could dial in if you are not able uh, to use computer audio. And these are selected articles that have been emailed to you ahead of time. I wanted to highlight before we have Jennifer start presenting uh, our new uh, agenda at the journal. And this really has been spearheaded by our editor in chief, Linda Bluebaker, as well as our new associate editor, uh, Rona Henry, who is basically doing this visual abstract for one of the showcased articles. Uh, this is something I hope people will download and use when giving presentations. Uh, the concept of today's journal club is, is very simple. It's basically centered around clinical care. All of us are taking care of people with pelvic organ prolapse, uh, many of which have concomitant uh, defects and need concomitant repairs. Uh, the bottom line is what I would hope people would take away from this is uh, some kind of evidence as far as how to proceed forward, perhaps how to uh, assess your own improvements and failures within your own patients and to draw some cursory conclusions from both the articles at hand as well as the greater literature. I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer. So we're hosting our journal club, but we're gonna carry it out in basic formats uh, like we do here. And so Jennifer Wong, you got the floor. Post operative follow-ups at 1, 12, and 60 months included a clinical examination and assessment of posterior compartment symptoms. Patients completed the prolapse quality of life questionnaire, the pelvic floor disability index, and the pelvic floor impact questionnaire, and the pelvic organ prolapse urinary incontinence sexual questionnaire. Okay, I think we talked about that. Mm. Okay, median follow-up, as we were saying, was 64 months. The median operative time was 55 minutes, and the median post-operative hospital stay was two days. No intraoperative complications occurred. Early post-operative complications included three cases of fever and six cases of UTI. The objective cure rate was 88.2%. The study defined objective cure of posterior compartment prolapse as remaining vaginal defects stage zero or one. Recurrence was defined as stage two or higher, and 11.3% of patients experienced recurrence. Subjective cure was assessed through the four previously mentioned questionnaires. Rectocele symptoms included defecatory dysfunction, vaginal digitation, and vaginal bulge. They decreased significantly postoperatively. The percentage of patients having regular sexual intercourse increased from 56 to 86%, and dyspareunia decreased from 21 to 3%. The study concludes that vaginal native tissue repair is safe and effective for symptomatic rectoceles. It has a low rate of complications and improves prolapse-related symptoms, quality of life, and sexual function. The study further recommends that symptomatic rectoceles should be initially managed by native tissue repair without the use of mesh, and that the use of mesh in prolapse surgery should be reserved for well-selected patients after failure of vaginal native tissue repair. That should be okay. Okay. What do I think about the article? Sorry, folks. I had to dial in through a phone, so just give me a heads up. Where, where did you leave off? You went to results, conclusions. <laughs> 
Okay. All right. So first, the first question I'll direct to Jennifer herself. Uh, what do you think about the paper? Give us your critical appraisal with respect to strengths and weaknesses. Oh, okay. There you go. And you stay on that audio. So first of all, I think this is a very interesting paper. One of the main critiques that I believe people will have is that it is retrospective. So just because of the retrospective nature, um, that can't be changed, but I think that it was a well-designed study in the fact that um, it was moderately sized and it had long-term patient follow-up up to five years, which we actually don't really see very much in the literature. Um, it analyzed both objective and subjective data because we know that clinical exam findings aren't always necessarily directly correlated to the patient's symptoms, and that's actually what we care about. And then since all cases were performed by a single surgeon, the surgical technique was more likely to be consistent, and that was less likely to be a confounding factor, um, less variability, so less likely to affect the results. Um, and while this study focuses primarily on the posterior compartment prolapse, almost half of these patients had multi-compartment prolapse, so it's not really analyzing just rectal seals, and that is reflective of the general population. So if we have a patient population similar to this, and we replicate Sciavi surgical techniques, I think it is promising and encouraging to think that patients undergoing native tissue repair will likely succeed and do well. While Schiave being a single surgeon is a strength, it's also a limitation because it decreases the generalizability of this technique. So only if you operate exactly like Schiave could you expect these techniques. So I'm not sure if I could replicate it, you could replicate it, but if we do it exactly like Schiave, then hopefully all of our patients will have good outcomes and low complications. Um, and then another limitation is that it doesn't really control for confounding variables such as the concomitant surgeries. 50% of the patients had other anterior apical defects repaired, and it's unclear whether or not fixing those defects could have affected the improvement of the patient's uh, rectal symptoms. Um, the power just, I mean, the study just isn't powered to analyze this, and I think that'd be really something uh, interesting to look at in the future. Okay, just to kind of go back into one of their main outcomes is that the surgery improved sexual function. And so this gets into the concept of internal validity and confounding variables. And you kind of talk about they're not really controlling for mm -hmm. confounders. There's something that's kind of buried deep in the article uh, that the authors do very routinely with respect to their patient care that I would consider as a major confounder for the improvement in sexual function. Anyone in the room have a sense on what that was? No, no, just on mute. Go ahead. Jennifer Chin, you can speak into the... I thought you folks were going to keep that ready to go and just mute it to decrease the reverb. It's been disconnected. Jennifer, why don't you answer the question since you have your mic? Oh. Can you grab the IT person? I think one of the interesting things that they did for the methods was that for the postmenopausal patients, they had them on topical estrogen for eight weeks prior to the surgery and then indefinitely during the follow-up period. And as we know, a majority of these patients, I believe the study quote 62% were postmenopausal. So it's difficult to tease out whether or not it was the surgery itself or the topical estrogen that could have affected or improved their sexual uh, function. Right, so you think about the, the average age in the study, or the mean, the mean age is 62, and if you draw two SDs around that number, 
you're likely to capture most people who are postmenopausal. And by age 54, somewhere about 40% are have vaginal atrophy. So the authors are making a deliberate attempt at treating vaginal atrophy while in parallel doing surgery on these patients. And so that's a major confounder. Okay, a couple of other questions. Uh, and I'd like to direct this to the dial-in participant. Uh, what's the difference between effectiveness and efficacy? Because in this particular study, the authors in their objective uh, use the term effectiveness. But is that really true uh, in the case of this paper? And Chris uh, Maher, are you on the call? Would you mind uh, filling in some blanks for us about your opinion about this paper? Well, Steve, um, thanks for that. And um, I think you asked Jenny to shine, and I thought you did a lovely summary of the Shabavi paper. There's an interesting point you, you raised about the confounder, and I think you've covered all the major points in the paper. What the Shabavi group have done is that every patient that comes to their clinic, they have a really good infrastructure of assessment of outcomes. So before the surgery, they have all these questionnaires and assessments. And after every surgery, they have all these questionnaires and assessments. And that has allowed them to produce a paper, which is really of a quite a good standard. Um, it's used, you know, the PISQ, uh, it's used all the effective questionnaires. Uh, I think it's a really good paper. Um, even though it's retrospective, they've got a, a good follow-up, very poor attrition of patients, useful tools for assessment, uh, and, and good outcomes. And, you know, what would be really nice to have is a video of that surgical technique, because I found the surgical technique a little bit hard to uh, follow exactly what they were doing, but I understand it was a central application of fascia, which is difficult to understand, using a OPDS suture with perineal repair is what I understood was happening in that surgery. So I think it was a good paper, and um, even though retrospective, very good. And I think Jennifer did a fine job in summarising. Thank you. Any, sp any specific comments from the dial-in participants at this time? You can type your question if you'd like us to address it, or I'll have Jennifer summarize and we'll move on. Hey, Steve, it's Tom Gregory here. You, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Great. I think you did ask the question about effectiveness versus efficacy, and I think that- That should be on. That really does become an important question for us all to consider whether it's this uh, set of uh, journal club or, or others. And I think it really goes to the heart of what is a, a fully loaded, everybody on the exact same page, doing the exact same technique all the way through a randomized control trial, i.e. efficacy trials, versus concept of effectiveness, which sort of more points to what we'll talk about perhaps in a second, a sort of pragmatic design, which sort of incorporates a lot of different things that are happening in real world, um, A versus B type treatment. Um, and so I, I think just, um, I, it's not really a lecture on efficacy versus effectiveness, but I think that we all need to not just interchange those terms because they are not the same thing. Uh, I really thank you, Tom, for those comments. And it's just to further it, I think effectiveness and efficacy are on a continuum and you can always have a little bit of both. Uh, to me, it, the Schiavi paper is really about efficacy because you're taking a person who has likely incredible skill and applying it in a very reproducible fashion at probably a high level institution with high level access to care among the patient population. And there's probably significant uniformity and homogeneity among the patients as well. 
Uh, with that in mind, I would like to go on and have Jennifer present the second article. The, the goal today is to present the articles in about under 20 minutes, have some critical appraisal, and leave the last 20 minutes of the presentation to really engage the uh, participants and have uh, an in-depth discussion about the two articles together. Uh, so Jennifer, let's go on to the second article now. Hey Steve, before and you, you can go, introduce it. Yeah. Yes. Before you go on to that second article and let Jen talk, Jennifer talk again, can you just make sure that everybody in the room has their phone muted and all those other mics that are in the room are muted unless somebody's getting ready to speak? Because there's still a lot of reverberation on our side of things, and I'm just wondering if that's mm -hmm. the source. There should be mm -hmm. one active mic in the room at the time, I think. Yeah, we have to turn off the sound. Okay. So we just have to turn the volume down for this. Yeah. And to the rest of the participants okay, who are out there, thanks for your um, um, flexibility as we work out some of the kinks. Uh, so Jennifer and I are mic'd on our phones just to improve the clarity of our voices, but we have a centrally located mic because I do want the residents to hear. Uh, does this sound better at this point? It is better when you guys are speaking because you're far enough away from that central mic. So I just, again, I don't know if it's the central mic that needs to be muted until somebody from the room wants to speak up and then you click it back on. Uh, it's been muted the whole time. Okay. It's just picking up our voices from across the room, I think. All right. Yeah. Uh, let's move on, Jen. And so our second paper is titled, Mesh Graft or Standard Repair for Women Having Primary Transvaginal Anterior or Posterior Compartment Prolapse Surgery to parallel group multi-center randomized controlled trials prospect. It was conducted by Glazner et al. at the University of Aberdeen in the UK and published by The Lancet in January 2017. The objective of this study was to compare the outcomes of prolapse repair with either synthetic mesh inlays or biologic grafts against standard repair. This is a pragmatic multi-center trial that was comprised of two parallel group randomized controlled trials from the years 2010 to 2013. Patients undergoing primary transvaginal anterior or posterior compartment prolapse surgery by 65 gynecologic surgeons at 35 centers were enrolled. Patients were randomized to one of two trials, either one, the mesh trial that compared standard native tissue repair with synthetic mesh, or two, the graft trial that compared standard uh, native tissue repair with biologic graft. Surgical technique was based on surgeon preference. For example, the surgery could be used midline or fascial application, and the surgeons could use any form of type one mesh or graft available. Patients and staff were blinded to the randomization unless there was a clinical need or request by the patient. Post-operative follow-ups were done at 6, 12, and 24 months. At 12 months, the objective cure rate was determined by clinical examination and by using the pelvic organ prolapse quantification system. At 6, 12, and 24 months, subjective cure was assessed based on the symptoms and using the pelvic organ prolapse symptom score. 4,083 potential subjects were identified, 1,126 patients were excluded due to clinical decisions or patient decisions, such as not wanting to use mesh, wanting their surgeon to decide the repair technique, and not wanting to be randomized. In the end, 1,348 patients were enrolled in the study, 865 were randomized to the mesh trial, and 735 were randomized to the graft trial. Mean age and parity were similar among all the groups, Based on the patient's pelvic organ prolapse symptom scores, symptoms and quality of life did not differ among the groups. 30% of patients who underwent prolapse surgery had a residual feeling of quote unquote something coming down, and more than 80% had at least one residual prolapse symptom. Serious adverse effects such as infection, urinary retention, and dyspnea 
excluding mesh complications did not differ among the groups. Mesh complications occurred in 12% of patients with synthetic mesh. This study concludes that mesh or graph augmentation does not improve short-term effectiveness or quality of life and that a large percentage, 12% of women, suffered a mesh-related complication. This study also suggests that transvaginal anterior or posterior prolapse surgery with or without reinforcement have poor outcomes. Okay, that's a good summary of the article so far. And uh, just like last time, if you want to go into kind of the critical appraisal, just about this article alone, uh, and then we'll kind of wrap up with comparing uh, the two as a as a whole. So this study is very interesting because it is large. It has over a thousand patients. It has actually thirteen hundred patients around. And it's randomized, prospective, tried its best to remain blinded, it's pragmatic, multi-center, 65 gynecologic surgeons. So it is generalizable. It is extremely generalizable. Anything goes more or less. Um, but that is also a potentially confounding factor because uh, there was not a consistency in the surgical technique. Some people use midline, fascial application, whatever the surgeon preferred. So that is a confounding factor, and the study was not hard to analyze this. Um, on the strength side of the study, they did, like Schiavi, follow both objective and subjective uh, improvements for the patients using validated measurement systems and questionnaires. Uh, this study is also interesting because its findings contrast that of the Cochrane Review in 2016, where the Cochrane Review had 37 different trials and they found that MeSH actually did help with um, prolapse symptoms and women's awareness of prolapse and they had fewer anatomical occurrence. But this study showed that more than 30% of women who had prolapse surgery had that residual feeling of something coming down and that more than 80% had one residual prolapse symptom. And it's kind of crazy and interesting to think that if you operate on all these patients with symptomatic rectal seals, 80% are still going to have residual symptoms. So with these results, yes, I can see how Glazner showed that mesh does have poor short-term outcomes. And um, I think one of the big limitations of the studies, if I had to point out, were the exclusion criteria. They identified over 4,000 potential subjects, but over 1,000 were excluded for either patient decision or clinical surgeon decision, and that could just be not wanting to be randomized to mesh or not wanting mesh in general. And that could be a big selection bias because maybe these patients who are frail and more likely to have mesh complications were excluded from this study. Um, another limitation is the short-term follow-up, I believe. If 12% of women already experienced mesh complications in two years, it's very interesting to think how many patients would experience further complications in uh, um, potentially like five year like fears uh, like Schiavi. So this study was performed in, I believe, 2010. So they could potentially look at these patients again and get more long-term data. And I think that'd be very interesting in terms of the mesh complications and the patient success rate. Uh, let's focus on the randomization schema uh, for a moment. And, and there's an appendix or a figure legend that kind of goes next to it with a lot of data. And you talked about how people could be declined, so to speak. Either they don't want to take a chance and get mesh, or their surgeon perhaps perceives that. And there's the selection bias. So what do you think, John? Do you think, so that's, potentially one source of producing pretty good results in all the surgeries, depending on which arm you are in, correct? Okay. With, with respect to the pragmatic design, 
and I guess the best term is anything goes. Let's talk about how that can influence the results. So you have 65 surgeons. Roughly how many cases are these surgeons doing? It's hard to say because maybe there's one surgeon who does high volume and then a few of the other surgeons do a rectocele here and there. So the breakdown I looked at, if you have 4,083 women identified during a 44-month study and you're looking at 65 surgeons in 35 centers without discriminating, you know, somebody does 100 and somebody does one. You know, on average, you're talking about very low volume amongst the surgeons. So that could potentially feed into this. You have a lot of people doing not too much prolapse. And in the end, when you have only the 1348 patients, you have even less cases represented by those surgeons. And they are allowed, what kind of graphs are they allowed to use? Anything that they want as long as it's type one. I believe so some of mesh them. and graft. And so you have mesh, which was the type, type one. one. But what about graft? Really there is you could have the kit, you could have the porcine. Hold on, let me find the table. And to the audience at large, uh, to solve our audio problems, we've basically disconnected our central audio. So unfortunately, I'm not going to have the other residents answer questions uh, because I just want to make sure everyone could hear. So it's, it's now going to be Jennifer and I and having the rest of you participate. Yeah. So for the graphs, you could have porcine acellular collagen matrix, porcine small intestinal submucosa, or bovine dermographs. Okay, so few cases per surgeon, multiple different approaches, potential selection bias asks the question, is any study truly randomized? And this is a great example of an effectiveness trial that, for example, can be used to make financial decisions in large payer systems, et cetera. But compared to the Cochrane Review, which looks at 37 trials, many of which are efficacy trials with the best circumstances possible, expert surgeons, high volume, specific techniques, specific graphs, specific mesh, et cetera. So Jennifer, let's put to you just kind of the last wrap up. We're at 9.30 and we have plenty of time to juxtapose the two articles. Do you want to speak to those two as a whole? And how does it help you, how does it help direct patient care at this point? They're actually very interesting articles because they both take a different take on a similar issue. You have one where it's the Schiavi, he is the efficacy, and then you have the prospect, which is the effectiveness, the pragmatic, anything goes, real life scenario. In terms of the takeaway, they're well, it's well-designed studies, but they all both have their strengths and limitations. And I think you have to take the conclusions with a grain of salt. Because not everyone is going to operate like Schiavi, and not everyone is going to operate with this, this pragmatic, confounding, can't control for all the different variables. I think they're both interesting. So here's a question. Uh, the authors state, according to our findings, and I'm quoting them, according to our findings, the first recommended therapeutic strategy should be native tissue surgery without the use of mesh. The use of mesh and prolapse surgery should be reserved for well-selected group of patients after failure of traditional colporophy, which is basically native tissue. And indirectly, the Schiavi paper is kind of saying that. Primary repairs, native tissue repairs work fine. And the prospect trial is saying, you know what, mesh causes problems and doesn't improve outcome. 
But on its own, Jennifer, does the prospect trial support that conclusion? It doesn't. The prospect trial is saying that mesh does not improve the outcomes with or with augmentation. I'm sorry, that, oh, sorry. let me interrupt. That's the obvious, that's the obvious conclusion. Oh, the Schiavi paper right. support this conclusion. Is that the question? That really the first repair should be traditional native tissue and not a mesh augment. Oh, I feel like it's difficult for Schiavi to come to that conclusion because the entire study is on posterior repairs. There's not any mention of a mesh, and then all of a sudden he concludes that native tissue surgery should be the first line, and then mesh should be used for reserved, well-selected patients after failure of this vaginal native tissue repair. But nowhere in this study is there mention of mesh. So I feel like it's kind of difficult to come to that conclusion. There's no evidence to support that. Right. So Schiavi is basically, to summarize, and we're going to move on to the audience questions in a moment. Schiavi is basically saying this. If you follow our methods of pulporophy, even in a mixed concomitant repair group, and I should add, add estrogen to their care, you can expect to improve sexual functioning, have low complications, and high success rates. And we can talk a little bit about their definitions of objective cure and objective improvement and objective failure if we have the time. But they really can't, it's not a comparative trial, so they can't really make claims that this is superior to mesh. And then you have the prospect trial that's saying basically, you know, there's no difference, but mesh seems to cause problems. So we're going to go to the audience question, and, and Chris Maher uh, asked the question, can we discuss 80% residual POP symptoms? It's certainly very high and worrying for patients, and it, it almost seems outrageous that that would be a number that would be in our minds, in our literature, when we're sitting in front of a patient discussing surgical options and how well they work and what their failure rates really are. Chris, would you like to add a few comments about that just to start us off? Tom, I'm not sure. was that question to me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Look, um, yeah. So if a patient walked into you in your consulting rooms and showed you that study result of 80% having residual symptoms, I think the patients would be, I think the conclusion of the prospect trial is that both native tissue repair and the mesh or graph repairs are poor. It's just that the meshes have a higher complication rate than the native tissue repair. And it's pretty hard to recommend a patient to have surgery if 80% of them are gonna have residual prolapse symptoms afterwards. Um, so Jenny, are you able to explain how they got that? Um, where that 80% symptoms came from for the rest of us? I believe it was from the POP SS. Not the validated questionnaire. Yeah. So look, um, that POP SS isn't really a, um, a common uh, tool that would be used in um, urogynecology literature. So it has seven questions. Um, the questions relate to one of the questions relates to backache. One of the questions relates to uh, abdominal discomfort. Um, so it's possible that that 80% of patients, you know, might've had backache or, um, or abdominal discomfort that they're measuring rather than that symptom. The best symptom we know in assessing prolapse is, are you aware of a bulge? And I think that score was about 30% which would be most probably more consistent with what most of us feel. So I think the use of that tool as the primary outcome, the POP-SS, and it, 
even though they say it's a validated tool, you know, it's very difficult to find. I'm sure Jenny's most probably look for it. It's very difficult to find uh, articles on it. The scoring system, um, it, it's it's not a widely recognised tool for a very big, uh, expensive trial. Um, so it's a little bit surprising. I think surprising that they use that tool um, so widely and on its own. Whereas Shivazi, in a retrospective analysis, used a whole lot of fantastic tools that are well validated um, for us, yeah. Chris, Tom Gregory out here in Portland. Uh, thanks. That's um, I, I was one. That was one of the questions I was trying to sort of bring up. That Pop SS tool is something that most of us, at least in the United States, I don't feel are really um, uh, utilized a lot. And and just to kind of go into the details of the definition of success, um, that which you've already pointed out, we've been talking about the the in order for it to have be a success, the score had to be zero, absolutely zero which is an interesting thing that I know that we've struggled with um, in previous um, NIH supported uh, here in the United States um, network trials in which we uh, started out with expectations of objective success, for example, of perfect support. Let's forget the subjective questionnaires, but the objective support had to be absolutely perfect. And as time has gone by, we've recognized that our expectation of optimal or uh, success has sort of changed over time. So it is fascinating um, and just kind of re reiterate the point that the expectation of no prolapse symptoms is, is essentially exactly that zero. But, but to your point, some of the questions are perhaps less um, correlatable to the finding of your urovaginal prolapse. Totally agree, Tom. It's um, the, the second outcome also, there's two primary outcomes utilized. So pop SS is one primary outcome. And the second primary outcome is a, um, what they call a quality of life score, but it's just a zero to 10 quality of life. It's unvalidated, there's no reference for it. it it's just a visual analog, zero to 10 quality of life. So, uh, you know, the tools, the primary tools utilized are um, not really quite specific, I think, or well recognized or validated uh, for a really large trial. Um, and, and that's a bit worrying. And then the other issue that um, we've already discussed significantly is that it's a terrible term, but anything did go in that surgery. You know, you don't know if they <laughs> use vinyl sutures for the native tissue repairs or cat gut, or, uh, you know, we saw that Shivavi used a long, you know, a slowly absorbable suture, the PDS. Um, I've actually written to um, Sharis, who's a, a good colleague of ours, and, and she felt that the pragmatic nature of uh, the trial was important. And it's a very worrying, um, for I think that whole group of surgeons involved that the results in this study are poor, not only in the um, mesh group, but they're also not great in the native tissue repair group either. Hey, Steve. Hey, Chris, this is Steve Yeah. No, go ahead. I, I think that, you know, looking at the pop FS and you have these very non-specific questions, heaviness or dragging feeling in your lower back or abdomen, tummy. That really speaks to your comment earlier that, you know, the, the likelihood that somebody is going to score positive or have some complaint at the end of the study is very high. And it also kind of goes into the fact that this is really a 28-point scale with seven items with a Likert score attached. Whereas in the Siabi paper, you have a multitude of well-validated tools, but you numerically have so many other questions that are trying to approximate the truth among what the patient, you know, perception of, of improvement really is. So there's almost a volume dependence here, too, as far as if I ask you 100 questions or I ask you 10 questions, 
If I'm going to ask 10 questions, those questions need to be even more specific and more directed at exactly what it is we're trying to fix. And in saying that, I say that the prospect trial is almost the, the bottom lower limit of how nonspecific and how general you can do a study on prolapse to try to generalize it to the globe. Everybody doing everything, not asking very specific questions. And that becomes kind of a cap. 80% is how often someone will say they have something wrong but it might have nothing to do with the index problem or the index surgery. And it becomes a benchmark on how to improve our studies looking forward. Um, you wanted to say something? I was just going to, you know, take the opportunity to kind of maybe just um, redirect to the Shavi paper for, for just a moment and just um, because I think what we're talking about is um, what looks like high high success for vaginal native tissue repair for posterior compartment. And um, although I know Jen Jennifer talked about the study design, I the way I read it as an editor and a peer reviewer um, took me in a direction that um, I wanted to ask more questions of the authors and have the methods section re re. Um, potentially rewritten in a future paper because my first read on it looks like 100% of patients who had this index surgery five years prior were available for follow-up and um, assessment and understanding of what their symptoms and objective sort of findings on exam are. And I'm just not sure that that's exactly what happened in this um, paper, and I'm just wondering if other people think the same thing as me. Um, Tom, you raise a really nice point. So we have a small unit in Italy running a trial, and um, you know they're nearly able to get a huge number of patients to come back five years later, which is a very difficult thing to achieve. And it speaks very highly of that group, of their infrastructure, of, of how they run their clinic, how they treat their patients. As compared to, you know, this group in the UK, and we saw it two years, the attrition rate was, was it 24% or I think it was around that number, relatively high at, at two years. And in comparison, you know, this small, Italian group were able to um, get the patients coming back, you know, up to five years later, which is a, a mammoth task. And it speaks very highly of how they run that clinic and the ethos in, in that clinic, I think. Uh, one of the problems with the definitions that the authors use in the Schiavi paper is they have objective improvement, I'm sorry, objective cure is basically stage zero and one. Objective improvement is basically at the end of the study or one stage down. And then failure is a two or greater. And so the question I had, which none of us can answer, is how did the authors treat someone who had a stage three rectocele who at the conclusion of the study had a stage two? Uh, they are both failed and both improved to the letter of the definitions the authors provide. And I had emailed Yavi that question uh, when we were working with the group to get the visual abstract approved, but I, I haven't heard a response. And furthermore, the authors don't really talk about how they handle that. They talk about cure and failures and yet they defined an improvement category, which is not really, to, to, to my recollection, handled in the, in the paper. So those are just some kind of minutia that people could focus on. And I agree with Tom, you know, it's almost like we need a, a, another rendition of the method section to really understand what was going on. Uh, but Jennifer and I talked about this extensively before today's presentation and at, at face value, they're saying they basically had a 100% follow-up. 
So to summarize the two articles, I guess, Jennifer, if you're taking a case of urovaginal prolapse and rectus seal in the office tomorrow, and you're thinking, patient tells you she's completed a course of physical therapy and tried a pessary but doesn't want to continue, and so you're planning a surgical approach. How do you use everything that we talked about and presented today in counseling her? Do you quote her an 80% failure rate? Do you plan on using a porcine graft or a proline mesh? Are you going to do a native repair? Because that's really the point of Journal Club. It's, it's dichotomous. It's twofold. One is to learn how to critically appraise the literature. But the other one is to see what literature can actually direct your care. And the Schiavi paper, as much as we've torn it apart and rebuilt it back up, at the end of the day, if you do what Schiavi does, you should expect these outcomes. And that's really great. I would love to tell a patient that their sex life will improve and that they have a low failure rate, as long as I do it that way. Exactly. So we have to make sure that all of our postmenopausal ladies get some estrogen cream eight weeks prior and indefinitely, and their sex life will be great. <laughs> and would you favor with the existing literature, knowing that Chris Marr is part of the Cochrane Project, of which showed that mesh seems to do better. So mesh or no mesh, what are you gonna do? First repair. I think I would have to go with Schiavi and do the native tissue repair. And granted his conclusion is that if it fails, then use mesh. And granted it doesn't have any evidence to support that, I would, that's the way I would probably go. Sorry, Dr. Marlin. <laughs> Are there any dissenters among the group? Chris, any specific comments of, both, of what we are concluding? I lost Chris there for a moment. Tom, um, anyone in the group want to text a question or ask a question? Sorry, Steve, I'm back on there. I was just daydreaming a little bit, but the, the, the native tissue repair has to be the first line repair. And I think that was the conclusion of the Cochrane Review as well. While there's somewhat, yeah. there were some advantages to uh, the introduction of mesh, especially on the anterior compartment, there, there was a very significant um, higher reoperation rate in the mesh group that made the uh, mesh hard to recommend in the first line. But you, you have raised the point, and it's another problem for that prospect study is, I think it's the only RCT that's performed on mesh compared to native tissues that didn't demonstrate an anatomical advantage for the use of the permanent mesh as compared to the native tissue repair. And, in itself, um, when you're running a study and your results aren't consistent with all the other groups, it's, it's worrying. Yeah. I mean, it's an outlier in that respect. And you bring up an important point. With the anterior mesh, you're most likely going to have a posterior compartment defect resultant if there's a failure. Is that kind of your read? That certainly was one of the problems um, with the, and that may be what happened in the prospect study. Perhaps, you know, they were using mesh in one compartment and it, it needs, the, the prospect study I think may, raises more questions than answers for people. And I think that's what's happening here for us today. And we're trying to drive a take home message. And the only take home message I think from these papers is one, that the native tissue repair should be first, and two, in our clinical assessment patients, you know, that model that Shivazi does on every patient walking into that clinic, getting all those questionnaires and assessments done preoperatively and postoperatively and long-term review of these patients is, it's a really good model for all of us to utilize in our everyday practice would be the two points I would take away. Yeah. 
I could not agree more. And I think it's a great model of how we should all behave uh, to improve uh, our, our clinical performance and definitely engage the patients when we are able to. And uh, in the Eurogyne division in, in Hawaii, we have a confined group that often has much, uh, if not longer, follow-up uh, because people are not traveling away so easily. Uh, we were about five minutes before 10. The goal was to complete the first journal club before then so that people have a few bonus minutes of free time. Uh, with that in mind, are there any other wrap-up statements people want to make, either via text or by audio? I just want to, hey Steve, this is Tom, and I just want to thank you for being willing to have your group be the first journal club for the, for the journal, and um, we know that there were some technical challenges that we just, um, I think we worked through, and that um, I appreciate Chris's time with us, and um, that uh, I think that, uh, just to reiterate the point that we are looking for clinical um, Sort of decisions along with it, but I think that it just really becomes incumbent upon us to make sure that we don't just run to the um, conclusion that we all take the moment to read the um, read our literature and think through it critically, so that we can come to our own conclusions and ask questions of each other in a respectful way, like exactly like we're doing today. So this is great, and thank you for for doing this. I'll take this time to thank Jennifer for presenting. It took a lot of courage to do this after I told her it was a national and international uh, audience. And I do want to thank my panelists, uh, Chris Maher, uh, Carl Jalad, and Tom Gregory, who spent an enormous amount of work just preparing and being available and being very thoughtful on the call. And finally, to Linda Brubaker, who's been spearheading new developments after new developments for our journal, including this one, and getting us a larger footprint uh, for people to rely on us as specialists in female pelvic medicine reconstructive surgery. So with that, I will end the session there. Congratulations much, on a successful inaugural journal club. Congratulations, Steve, and everyone. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Nice to be involved. Thanks, everyone. Take care now. Thank <laughs> you.